Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to the Monday edition of this week's studies. As we return to this document and as we address items that are being presented, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his blessing so that we might more correctly be able to understand what others are presenting and then be able, when necessary, to speak words that you would have us, that our Heavenly Father would have us to speak. Shall we now ask for his guidance in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, there is so many things that we do not yet understand. We have sinned, we have fallen short of your glory. We ask today for your forgiveness, for your guidance, and for your direction. Help us now that we may correctly apply that which has been presented by the pioneers. Help us so that we might truly understand that which you would have us to understand. Direct this conversation. Be with us now in all things. I thank you for those that are joining in this meeting, and I ask a blessing upon them, each one. We ask, Father, for your spirit to open our minds, to direct us, and help us to recall those things that we most need. May your angels attend us. We ask and we thank you for this. Be with us now so that we might, as brothers and sisters, be able to converse and address that which we are seeing. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, this is the portion where we were at last yesterday. The quotation that's being given is that every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. Rule one, Miller's Rules. Yeah, so he has interpreted this rule as not about really every word, like he's focusing upon the subject. Correct. So he's interpreting this rule to, you need to figure out what the subject is so that you can determine what words uh, apply to that subject, which is not what Miller is saying at all. If we broke down what Miller is saying, his subjects in this, every word must have its proper bearing. We cannot discount any portion of any passage in the word of God. Right. And he's referring to subject would be not like subject and object in a sentence. Right. He's not talking about the noun that is the subject. He's talking about the topic. Correct. Yeah. Now, we cannot afford to act as did Elder Butler, the former General Conference president who had attempted in the 1880s to state that there are portions of the Bible that are not inspired. We cannot, it it shocks me that he would, in a prior article, make it so very clear how we should not focus on the minutia. And yet here, he wishes to focus strictly on the topic, the subject. Rather yeah, than well, every word. And, and he's not even calling it the topic. When he says the subject, right? He, he's using it more in a linguistic sense. Mm-hmm. You know, right? You know, like in a sentence, you have the subject and the object. The subject is the thing that does the action, or, and the object is the thing that receives it. Right? Right. So, so that's how he's trying to apply it. And, and he's, he's not really applying it very consistently. I mean, he's he's taking it sort of as this part of the vision has a subject, and so we always have to refer to this subject, but he's not consistent in doing that. And it, it becomes really bizarre when you read these uh, this, the following paragraphs, what he's trying to do. I'm not sure I fully understand his position because he's not clear, but it's definitely not what Miller's rule number one is referring to, right? And, and Miller is not even arguing that every word must have its proper bearing on the context, right? Okay. So, so when Miller approaches things, I mean, everybody's heard that you know, how's it go? A something without the context is a pretext. You know, there is this this idea. You know, you see event uh, presented in evangelistic series. That's where I first heard it. You know, is you need to know the context in order to understand any verse. That is, it's actually an attack against what we would call proof texting. Yeah, a text without 
a context is a pretext. That's how it goes. But we can see that Paul in the book of Hebrews in chapter one and, and many places in the New Testament, they will take a verse out of its context and give it a meaning, a meaning that's not directly related to the context. Right? Okay. Right. So, you know, he'll he'll have some references um, in, in Hebrews chapter one, you know, to Christ, you know, being God or Christ, you know. Um, and if you look at those verses, they're not particularly referring to Christ. But he uses those verses because he understands that that the Bible has a symbolic. And there's a symbolic aspect to the Bible. You know, the same as when, you know, a virgin shall conceive a bear, a son shall call his name Emmanuel. If you look at the the context of that, the context is this child that's going to be born in that history, not, you know, Christ. But we can apply it to Christ, not just because some New Testament writers do, but because the one that's going to be born is the king of Judah, Manasseh. And Manasseh is a type of Christ. And so... And it's not particularly talking about a virgin birth, though Christ is born of a virgin. And so you can apply that text to Christ. And this is something that's not well understood. So Miller would never even, doesn't even have a rule that says you must only understand the verse in its immediate context, right? He understands that there is a context that is all of scripture, Right. So when we do word studies, when every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible, he's talking about the topic, the, the different doctrines of Scripture. We have to look at every single word. So that's not what uh, Glenn is doing here in this study. He's not following uh, the simple way of studying the Bible. Right. Because when we read Scripture, first, we, we need to know that all that no prophecy of scripture was of any private interpretation for holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, right? That is, in order to understand the scripture, the reason we pray before we study the Bible is because we need the Holy Spirit to give us the same inspiration that the Bible writers had who wrote it. So the Bible is not just a human book. You know, it's just not it's not a collection of men's ideas. It's something that's inspired, which, you know, um, people who don't know God and haven't read the scriptures prayerfully don't recognize. But uh, once somebody comes in contact with God through the scriptures, you definitely do recognize that it is inspired, that it reaches beyond the ideas that man would have living in those times and that it reaches to us as an individual. So that's what Miller is talking about with this rule number one. And, and Glenn here is just twisting the words of Miller's rules to fit this idea. So it, it, to me, it's, it's how we study is so important Right. I mean, first, you know, we we're we're studying so that we can be changed. Right. We're not studying to argue against other people. Um, and I don't know Glenn personally. I know you do, Dwight. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm having a really hard time figuring out what what he's thinking. You, you understand what I mean. Right. I do. Yeah. Because if 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 I'm going to communicate something to somebody, I, I'm going to be telling them what I'm thinking. Right. Correct. That's that's why I communicate. I want a person to know what I'm thinking. But he doesn't seem to have the ability to tell us what he's thinking. And that, that's really peculiar. In, in a situation like this, he mm-hmm. is attempting to put things in written form where in his mind he's saying some things one way, but the written form is coming out entirely different. Yeah, I mean, it could be just... A lack of skill in writing. I mean, sometimes, you know, you know, the trumpet has to give a certain sound, right? A clear, definite sound. And, you know, if you're not a good trumpet player, you might have a hard time doing that. That's, um, it's interesting that you'd refer to that because when we were much younger, he was a trumpet player. Okay. Yeah. 
you know, and, and, and I recognize even in my ability sometimes to communicate. I don't always communicate as clearly as I would like. You know, there's limitations to language. So no one's perfect on that. But he seems to misunderstand concepts and ideas and words, you know, like he keeps using the word principle in a way that it's not a principle or he uses the word conclusion um, and isn't giving a conclusion. So um, so we're not trying to be hard on him. We're just trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, I wish I wish he would watch these videos and, and we could get some feedback from him. Yeah. Now, as he, and I don't disagree, it would be good if he would and provide some feedback in this in this area. Mm -hmm. Now, this second sentence, the king of the south and the king of the north are not the subject of the prophecy, but receive their bearing from the subject, the king of verse 36. Now, yeah. Yes, so we got the king of the north and the king of the south in verse 40, which are battling against each other. He's going to say they're not, and he's going to say that's because they're battling against the subject, which is the king of verse 36. And which, and that doesn't make any sense. Well, it's trying to introduce a third participant. Yes. In this situation. It's similar to what Uriah Smith did, except Uriah Smith introduced the third participant as France in verse 36, instead okay. of papacy. Now, part of the issue that I have here, one of the few items that Mrs. White had provided in reference to verse 36 was from letter 103, 1904, beginning in paragraph 15. Mm -hmm. But the translators... When they are looking at this, since 1136 is the beginning of a new, whether we call it thought, passage, book, whatever. Paragraph, uh, yeah, section. It, it, it's a new section marked out by the translators. So the king shall do according to his will. Now, the translators gave reference here back to Daniel 1116 which reads, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land by, by which his hand shall be consumed. Now, in which this... Which is referring to pagan Rome there, does according to his own will. Correct. And in that, I believe Glenn was in agreement that in verse 16, this had a reference to pagan Rome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's going to have verse 36 is be papal Rome. Okay. So we know we have these successive kingdoms. Um, each of these kingdoms are going to do according to their will, right? That is, that is that they're in opposition to God in some way, right? That's the idea right. they're doing according to their own will. Now, this king, as the verse continues, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things. I'm stopping there for a moment. Because the portions of that passage, the translators applied Daniel 7, verse 8, 7, 25, 8, 25, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, and Revelation 13, 5, and 6. Yeah, so definitely the Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, which is dealing with the papacy, the man of sin. And paganism has to be taken out of the way to make place for him. So, But Revelation 13, 5, and 6 backs that up almost entirely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, So, but he's going to argue that the, that, that the king of verse 36 is the papacy. He's going to, he, but he's he's saying that this is separate from the king of the north and the king of the south. Right. So the king of the north and the king of the south are going to come against the papacy. Okay. That's what he's going to have uh, happen. Now, as this was to continue on, on his, in his next paragraph, paganism is the subject proper, meaning that the kings of the south and the north are defined by the relationship to the remaining pagan powers of media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And that's a really not correct. So the king of the north and the king of the south 
derive their meaning from the fact that Greece is divided to the four winds of heaven and then the king of the north, the Seleucid Empire, uh, with, you know, various Antiochuses, and then the Ptolemic Empire, right, in Egypt, um, being the king of the south. That's where we get the meaning of the kings of the north and the kings of the south. Right. They're not defined by their relation to the remaining pagan powers of Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia, there is no king, north, king, south in that history at all. So it, it comes from Greece, and then Rome is going to conquer the king of the north, the Seleucid Empire, becoming the king of the north, and then eventually will also conquer the king of the south. But it still retains the title, the king of the north, right? So, I mean, we went through this in detail, but... Um, trying to to understand what he understands about Daniel chapter 11. It's, I don't know how much he studied it or what he understands about these verses. His focus tends, tends to be verse 31 to 45, but I'm not sure what he thinks about all the other verses. You're saying in verse 16, he would agree that the one that does according to its own will is pagan Rome. That's the way it, it looks. Yeah. Okay. I didn't see it to verse 16 at all but i'll go back i i'll find a, a point since we're we're going to be limited on time today i'll find his point and then we can address that further well we're not going to be that limited on time we're just leaving a few minutes early right but i mean <laughs> it, it takes me a bit to scan through yeah okay now so in verse 31 where we get paganism uh being taken out of the way and being replaced by papalism, right? So that's the daily is going to be taken away. Okay. Replaced by the abomination of desolation. So go on if you want to read that paragraph. Right. The same holds true for the kings of the south and the north after verse 31. The king of verse 36, identified as the papacy, is the subject of the entire span from verse 31 on through verse 45. The principal subject has now changed from paganism up to verse 31 to that of papalism from verse 31 forward. It is the papacy then from which the kings of the south and the north of verse 40 obtain their identity. The understanding of who the kings of the south and the north represent present must be derived from their position relative to the papacy. In both cases, these kings are antagonistic to the papacy. Okay, so the reason why they're called North and South has to do with their relation to Israel, okay. right? I mean, that's why North, South, East, and West are going to get their designations, because everything's from the perspective of Palestine. So you know, and especially, you know, God's people in, in Judah, right, in southern Palestine. So he he makes this statement here, but there's no evidence whatsoever that that, especially when it comes to Greece, that the north and south get their designation because of their relation, their position relative to the papacy. I mean, that's ridiculous. Well, right. If you're going to say in relation to the papacy, well, then you know, one is south, but the other would be uh, east. There again. Right, and of course the papacy doesn't exist. Like, so so we'd have to say in relationship to paganism, I guess, not the papacy. So, it, 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 anyway, it's I don't know what he's trying to do. I'm a little bit frustrated with him, <laughs> even though I don't know him. <clears throat> the issue that, that is still... For you know, front and center in my mind, the the understanding that the majority of the movement has always applied from study has been that the king of the north and the king of the south have been paganism versus papalism. The king of the north and the king of the south is paganism versus papalism. Well, I mean that's that's the way that I've heard Jeff apply it. I, I've never heard that. Where he had taken Egypt first, France second, Russia third. Now, am I missing something? 
I don't, I don't, I just don't know what you're talking about. I mean, the king of the north and the king of the south. Um, we never had the king of the south. The king of the south is Egypt. The king of the north is Syria. When it comes to Greece, pagan Rome conquers Syria. It becomes the king of the north. Yeah. And then it eventually conquers Egypt, you know, in the time of, of you know, Antony and Cleopatra there when Correct. Augustus, you know, conquers, conquers Egypt. And it becomes then completely a part of the Roman Empire. Um, and so, so then we're going to have no king of the north and king of the south mentioned in Daniel 11 until the time of the end. And so the king of the south and the king of the north aren't literally the king of the south and the king of the north of, of the kingdoms of Greece because that no longer exists. Okay. So, so that means that we're understanding them as symbols. So the king of the south, Egypt, symbolizes, you know, atheism, right? And uh, the king of the north symbolizes the papacy because you have, you know, Assyria and Babylon come from the north and the papacy is modern Babylon. And the king of the south, atheism, you know, you have Catholicism or not Catholic, communism and, um, you know, France, of course, is the king of the south because of its atheistic stance. So I've never heard anybody ever say that the king of the south is paganism. I so. agree. Paganism and atheism is basically the same thing. So that that may be a fault of mine. Yeah, is they're not. Okay. Yeah then I apologize if I cause confusion. Yeah, okay. Now. Apology accepted. Okay. <laughs> now, the point that, that he makes in these two sentences to say that the understanding of who the kings of the South and the North represent must be derived from their position relative to the papacy. In both cases, these kings are antagonistic to the papacy is something that is entirely hard to understand because he's not here to defend his position or to explain himself. Well, he's never told us in, so far in the papers, like even when I look at, because this is number 11 and we get to number 12, he doesn't tell us who the king of the north is. Right. So I assume that he's going to have it to be something godly, right? Something good, which, which, uh, but it's just none of it makes sense. Right. You know, so it, it's, I mean, and the reason we're studying this, I mean, again, you know, it's not to tear down plan. We're, we're trying to understand about how we ourselves study and understand scripture. Because, you know, there's often these attacks within the movement and, and outside of the movement as far as how the, some of the things we believe, why do we believe them? And, you know, the position that we've taken has always been, well, if we just we're just studying the scriptures. If if you have a problem with what we're saying, can you show us where we've gone wrong? And of course, nobody ever tries to do that, right? And so when we're dealing with some somebody else's material, we want to understand what they think, right? So that's the approach that we would use, that we would want other people to do with us. So you know, we're not attacking Glenn, but. I wish, you know, I could talk to him and, you know, just try to get where, where he's, he's going, but he's going to be arguing, you know, he's, if I was going to sum up his whole argument, he has this argument, you know, Satan doesn't fight against Satan and yet he completely contradicts it. So it, it, it doesn't really make any sense. He's not being consistent and he keeps using the word principle when he doesn't mean principle, which annoys me. <laughs> With this in mind, the statement, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, must be viewed in reference to the principal subject. As the king of the south draws its bearing from the papacy, the larger entity and principal subject then, it is against the papacy that the king of the south is directed, but only against the papacy as the king of verse 36. Now, he's attempting to... to make a division papacy version a versus papacy version b no that's not what he's doing 
Okay, then what is he doing? He's he's just saying that the king of the south is pushing at him. That's not the papacy, or or that is the papacy. Pardon me, it's not the king of the north. Right. So he doesn't have the king of the south and the king of the north pushing at each other or fighting against each other, even though he has said that they have, and but that they also fight against the papacy. So, he, right. So he says they they fight against each other, but they also fight against the papacy. But when it says at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, that's the king of the south pushing at the papacy. But the him is not the king of the north, is what he's arguing. Right. So so we know Louis F. Weir, back in the 1950s, showed what was going to happen in 1989. Right. That's going to be when the king of the north comes against the king of the south. And that's what happened with the fall of the Soviet Union. So so we we. We have a prediction that was made based upon Daniel 11, verse 40. That prediction came true, and yet he's going to just brush that aside and say, well, you know, because he would have to reject 1989 then, unless he's got some other way that he's going to try to do this. But what he is doing, he does have three parties. The him, he is going to argue, is the papacy, and that the king of the south is some other power, which he doesn't tell us what it is. And the king of the north is some other power. So I would assume that he's going to say the king of the south is is Egypt. But I'm not certain that's what he's going to say. Because lots of times you think he's he's leading somewhere and then he leads somewhere else. But um, anyway, we, we have to go on and read what he says. Okay. Now, his next segment. He states the same principle holds true with the king of the north. Here he quotes Daniel 1140. Now, it's intriguing to me because Daniel 1136 begins a a new thought process, a new segment. Paragraph, we could say. Okay. And Daniel 1140 also begins a new segment. So... Shouldn't the verses from 1136 to 1139 as a group be studied and not just picking and choosing? Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, uh, probably those those sections are more like pages on a document initially. Okay. I think they refer to. So things can still continue. It's just like when we have our chapter divisions. Sometimes our chapter divisions are actually di- divided in the middle of a sentence <laughs> yeah. where people chose to put the chapter. And, and even verses sometimes split up sentences, which, you know, just because of how they interpreted where the sentence was. But, um, yeah, so so I don't think that, you know, it's it's definitely – a completely new thought or anything. Okay. But but his argument that, that there's this subject that we have to somehow hold to and that he's going to argue about the use of the word him, which of course we've dealt with before in Hebrew, that it's not like in English. You know, you don't you don't look at the antecedent, you know, to know who the him is referring to. It's more grammatical structure that doesn't exist in English. <clears throat> now Daniel 1140 reads, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. Now, the understanding that we've had is that at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at the king of the north. Right. And the king of the north shall come against the king of the south like a whirlwind, with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships. And the king of the north shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Right. So we took this as 1989, the days of the whirlwind. Uh, The second part, Daniel 11, verse 40b, and the first part of the verse is 1798, when the Pope was taken captive by France. 
right? So you have uh, France being the king of the south, papacy being the king of the north. Here, he's going to have the king of the north and the king of the south. Are Neither of them is the papacy. And the him is going to be the papacy. Okay. Right. So so the king of the south is going to come against the papacy and the king of the north is going to come against the papacy. Or technically, the king of the south is going to push at the papacy and the king of the north shall come against the papacy. He hasn't told us when these are or what the king of the south or the king of the north are, which so, I assume would be his his paper number 13, article number 13. But this is number 11. But even in 12, he doesn't tell us. Now, this next paragraph he wishes to divide this in the following manner and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him and he says here full stop him equals the king of verse 36 the papacy the principal subject this is the only him that can be identified previous to the action of the king of the south again he returns to scripture and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. Again, full stop at the word him. Who is the word him referring to? It is still the king of verse 36, the papacy, the principal subject. Again, it is only it is the only him that is identified previous to the action of the king of the north. The king of the south is not identified as him. Only the papacy as the king of verse 36 has been identified as him. Right. So this is ignoring Hebrew grammar. Correct. And he he is not going to attempt anything with Hebrew grammar. No. No, I know. But we, we need to know that when we're reading the Bible, that how they use... The personal pronouns is different than how we do it in English. So to know who's being referred to, it, you don't have to have an antecedent. Okay. Right. Now, of course, since we already take that the king of the north is the same person in verse 36, right? Okay. You know, the one who exalts himself and all that stuff, right? That does according to his will. We already take that to the papacy. Uh, we have no problem saying, well, the him is the papacy, right? So even in his argument, well, we can say, yeah, of course, the king of the south is coming against the papacy. But then when we get to the king of the north, he is now going to argue that, well, the him has to be the same him that is in the previous sentence, the previous part of the verse, right? But we know that that's not the case and that since the king of the south is masculine, uh, the king of the north can would be referred to uh, the same power that's in verse 36, right? Because we already recognize that that Rome becomes the king of the north earlier in the chapter. So for it to be referred to as the king of the north, uh, partly is because the power that's going to come against it is going to be referred to as the king of the south, so that means we now that there's, understand there's something symbolic going on here, that it's using the past history. And, and we've shown that the Battle of Raphi and the Battle of Paneum are typical of these events, right? So the Battle of Raphi in verse 11 and the Battle of Paneum that follows in, in the other verses, right? So he's going to ignore all that. Right. He's not going to be thinking about how the previous history, how how Bible prophecy is lined up in this repeat and enlarge that the previous events become typical of events that follow. Right. And we, we already established this. So to to what he's doing with the king of the north and the king of the south, just you, you couldn't do this if you understand the rest of the chapter, the verses that go before this. Okay. The. The other problem that I'm having is that even for a moment, even if we set aside the Hebrew grammar, mm -hmm. if we were to study properly with Miller's rules 
and in the way that Father Miller studied mm -hmm. with his King James Bible and his Cruden's Concordance, many of these situations would would still yet be revealed clearly. Yeah, because even if we, we're going to um, follow the rules that he has set out, that Glenn has set out here, you know, he's going to tie our hands behind our back and, and blindfold us, we would still not come to the same conclusions that he came to. Right. Right. So, so he has tried to, to restrict what we can do, right? He's, we can only use the King James Bible and um, he's not going to use Hebrew or Greek or anything like that. But you can easily see how, even if you don't understand Hebrew grammar, that you can, you can see that the king of the south comes against him. Well, obviously, that's the king of chapter 36 onward, right, to 39. The king of the south is going to come against him. And then when it says the king of the north shall come against him, you're not going to think it's the same him, right? You can easily see that it's the king of the south is also a him, right? Correct. You, you can't argue that the him now could only refer to the him of verse 36 and on, right? You you can't say that you can't have another him because you have another power, the king of the south. And the king of the south is a him just as much as the king of the north is a him, just as much as the papacy is a him in these in this context. Let's let's look at it this way. Let's say that you, I, Iran, Stephen, Kelly, Samuel we are all in a a room and there are let's say 35 different women around us and let's say that some of these women wish to refer to him or he in their conversation if him only refers to one part of that conversation to one person then how do you how do you give reference to the others? Yeah. So I mean, call people by names, right? So, right. so you're going to have King of the North and the King of the South. But the way that I look at it is pretty simple. You have the papacy, verse thirty six onwards. Mm -hmm. The King of the South is going to come against him, right? Right. And since it's the King of the South coming against him, then he's then the King of the North. Right. Because the king of the south only comes against the king of the north in Daniel chapter 11. They fight against each other when they're north and south. Right. Because that's that's an internal war, a civil war within Greece. Right. When they're talked to whenever they're referred to as the king of the north or the king of the south, that's when they're in conflict with each other. Right. OK. But now. So, so now that the king of the south comes against the papacy. It's natural that you would then refer to the papacy as the king of the north, especially, especially since the previous history of the Battle of Raphia and the Battle of Panea have typified these events, 1798 and 1989. So you can easily show that without re referring to the Hebrew grammar or anything. So, so his argument that somehow these are two different powers, the king of the north and the king of the south, coming against the papacy. It, it's it's not something that you would uh, discern from the text at all. It's something that right. he's imposing on the text. And, and he's in, imposing it as a solution to a problem that he hasn't really well defined, right? So in these papers, he first looks at this, this problem, which he never really defined well. He, he misrepresented what was actually going on and what was thought. And and now, so he, this is supposed to be a solution to a problem, but it's a much bigger, his solution, like every time the government has a solution to the problem, other uh, solutions are the problem. Um, so, so it's kind of the same way. He's trying to fix something that doesn't need to be fixed. Now, and, and part of it's just that he had a lack of understanding of some things, which if he would have had the correct understanding, he would have seen that there wasn't a problem. But I think part of the problem is is other people that he's responding to who have brought in different ideas. And so he's trying to resolve those. But but this isn't resolving it. No. The next paragraph. 
and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He, who is this he? Still the king of verse 36, the principal subject. He, the papacy, the subject, is initiating a counterstrike in response to the actions taken against him by the king of the south and in turn by the king of the north. Okay. So, 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 so now he's doing something that's quite, quite odd, um, because the king of the north should be the he. Right. But now he's just going to say, well, every time we see here he or him, it's the papacy. It's the principal subject of verse 36. Right. But that never happens. Right. If, if you applied that to the scripture, you applied it to any anything you, you would run into all kinds of problems because once you introduce some of the power you're still going to use he right so and it doesn't make sense that that the king of the north shall come against the papacy like a whirlwind with chariots with horsemen and with many ships and then the papacy is going to enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over because when when you're looking at what happens with the king of the north coming against the papacy in his mind, right? What this whirlwind, chariots, horsemen, many ships. I mean, this is a conquering of the papacy, right? And this is typified by the Battle of Paneum when, you know, uh, the king of the north conquered the king of the south so that the king of the south was, had, had lost all of its power, basically, right? In, in the kingdom of Greece. So, to say that he must be still the same as the hymns doesn't follow. It doesn't track. Yeah. So he's going to say it's a counter strike. So he's not going to just have the king of the south coming against the papacy. He's going to have the king of the north. And then he's going to have the king of the north retaliating. And he shall enter into the countries. And the natural way to understand that is that this is the king of the north that enters into the countries, not the hymn who the king of the north came against. I mean, I understand his 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 logic. It's just not correct. It's the introduction of a third party that bothers me. Well, yeah, and also the fact that the king of the north and the king of the south fight against each other in the type. So, you know, when we're using here, this, this is a repeat of history now with new powers, not with, you know, Syria and Egypt, but with... Uh, the papacy in France and the papacy and the Soviet Union, right? Which in our time replaces France. Yeah. Well, th this next, this next paragraph identifies a point and this is the, the issue that causes me the greatest of concern. Well, it, it, he seems to contradict himself here. The king of the south pushes against the king of verse 36, which is clearly identified as the papacy. How then does the king of the south also push against the king of the north? It does not. In order for that to happen, the king of the north must somehow become the papacy, as the papacy is the only entity that the king of the south pushes against. This is exactly what the popular interpretations attempt to do. The argument is often put forth that because Babylon is portrayed as the king from the north, so it must also apply to the king of the north of verse 40. But it must be remembered that Christ is the true king of the north. Yeah. Okay. So what, what, what causes your heartburn here? I mean, I can tell you what causes my heartburn, but... His statement is three words that says that the king of the south does not push against the king of the north. Yeah, so he's arguing that the, the one that pushes at him is the king of the south pushing against the papacy. But he's, he's going to... So here's what some people do when they're presenting an argument. So um, the argument that's put forth, right... Because Babylon is portrayed as the king of the north, which is an argument we put forth. Babylon is the king of the north. Egypt's the king of the south. Right. Egypt is typifying 
these atheistic powers, the French Revolution and the Soviet Revolution, right? These atheistic powers in our time. Right. So, because Egypt does not acknowledge the true God, who is who is the Lord that I may worship him, right? Pharaoh says. So, so it becomes a symbol of what we see happening in our time. And of course, we see that all laid out in Revelation chapter 11, what happens with France. So, so now here, he, he's going to mention this, this argument, but he's to, in order to dismiss it, he brings up this other point, which is correct, but it also must be remembered that Christ is the true king of the north. Well, yes. So we know that Satan seeks to uh, take Christ's throne, the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north, right? Christ is the true king of the north. These are obviously counterfeits. So the papacy is a counterfeit of Christ's kingdom, right? We can see that quite clearly in how the papacy operates and acts. It's trying to bring Christ's kingdom on earth through you know, the Catholic Church, right? Through the papacy and, and all of its, the way that it has worked throughout history trying to do that. So, but it must be remembered that Christ is the true king of the north is not an argument against that argument. No, it is. <laughs> right? It's like, he just says, but it must be remembered that Christ is the true king of the north. Yeah, well, okay, that's good. It must be remembered. But it doesn't negate what that that argument that you have presented. Right. So there's the the differences in the way that he's presenting this here. Ultimate. Yeah. Yeah. It gives me heartburn, but it's also very confusing. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I understand his his position now. I mean, his position, there's there's the papacy and then there's the king of the north and the king of the south, which he hasn't tell, told us who they are and how, how where we would mark them. You know, the king of the south pushing at the papacy. I'm assuming it still put it in 1798. Uh, but where the king of the the north comes against the papacy and where the papacy retaliates, he hasn't shown us that yet, where he's going to put that. Well, he hasn't shown us either of them, but well, yeah. His next, his next several paragraphs attempt to support this position. The text does not read in any way that the king of the south initiates an attack against the king of the north or that the king of the north attacks or retaliates against the king of the south. Nor does the text in any way tell us that the king of the north has now become the papacy. The text does tell us that the papacy, as the king of verse 36, receives two specific strikes against itself, which provokes it to take countermeasures. In all of the other references in Daniel 11, the relation of the king of the south to the king of the north are clearly defined. Each text states that they are fighting against each other, verses 5 through 7 and verse 11. Cast up a mount against each other, verse 15. Sitting at the same table as each other, verse 27. Not so in verse 40. In other words, if the king of the south and the north are fighting against each other, the Bible, the Bible clearly says so in, in plain English. Now, his, his logic here, I don't find that it supports itself. Right. So, so we know that every time we see the king of the north and the king of the south, they're fighting against each other. And they are typical of something that's going to happen at the end of the world. Right. So that history is being repeated. But of right. course, literally in, in symbols. So when we're dealing with the king of the north and the king of the south in verse 40, obviously it's not literally the northern part of, of Greece and the southern part of Greece, right, of Alexander's empire. It has to be understood that it's, that it's symbolic. So the king of the north has to be symbolic and the king of the south have to be symbolic. And as such, then, the fact that they're both being mentioned means that they're in battle against each other. That would be the plain reading of verse 40. But but he's using a type of circular reasoning. It is that, but it's also intensely poor grammar in this final sentence of this third paragraph. 
Well, I know, but we don't need to worry about people's grammar. That's not an argument. It's just, I use bad grammar sometimes, but, but it makes it unclear. Very. It's, it's intriguing because his comment here is the Bible clearly says so in plain English. It's for me intriguing because we recognize this portion of Daniel Mm -hmm. is in the Hebrew, but portions of of the book of Daniel are also in Chaldean. We have so many different things that the translators had to do for this to come into English. Not all of them are easy to understand unless we really want to apply ourselves. Father Miller applied himself because he was given from Gabriel, which means from Christ, from the Father, Mm -hmm. his rules. From the Father to Christ to Gabriel. Right. William Miller. Now, our situation here is that Father Miller used the rules, used also his Crudence Concordance, and his King James Bible in his study. He did not use the words of Uriah Smith, Leroy Froome, Roy Allen Anderson, or any other of the commentators that right now are prevalent, especially prevalent within Adventism. And I think part of this confusion is trying to give a support for what Uriah Smith was saying that is counter to that which Ellen White has said. But this doesn't support Uriah Smith's view. It do, the way he's going at it, it does not support Uriah Smith's view, but in, in, in a very offhand way, he is supporting Uriah Smith's view because he's trying to introduce a different party. Yeah. But, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he's trying to retain one idea Uriah Smith had, but switch all the parties around. Right. Um, so I don't think that would satisfy the people who want to have Uriah Smith's view be correct. No. It, you know, it's not going to satisfy them. And it's just going to create more confusion. Correct. But but still, you know, the process, why we're going through this, right? Again, it's not to tear down Glenn, but it's to try to understand how we study. And um, so how we study is we take all of the scriptures and, and what he's presenting here, where he's talking about, well, in the past they fought against each other and we were always told they were fighting against each other, but it is actually telling us in plain English, they're fighting against each other. Right. Right. But he says, you know, the Bible would clearly tell us in plain English if they were fighting. But the fact that they're always fighting would mean that they're always they're still fighting here in verse 40. You wouldn't have them every time we see the king of the north and the king of the south, they're not fighting against or they're fighting against each other. And this time, well, this time it's it's an exception. Well, that wouldn't be the case. And and so what he fails to take into account is how the Bible, why the Bible uses these different symbols. You know, it's just like when we have Michael, you know. Michael referring, you know, to the archangel, you know, when we say that that's Christ, it's not actually an angel. Because Michael is a name that's used as a challenge against Satan. So whenever he's in conflict with Satan, he's referred to as Michael, right, who is like God, you know, as a challenge. So so people there's so many examples of this where we see a title is used or a phrase is used because of previous context and symbolism that's attached to it so so the fact that you have the king of the north and the king of the south being referred to it at all means you need to look at the king of the north and the king of the south earlier to understand what what they what they are symbolizing but but he hasn't told us what he thinks they symbolize yet right okay it is this relationship between the kings of the south and the north previous to verse 31 that leads one to conclude that the same relationship must also exist between the king of the south and the king of the north after verse 30. Okay, so 
if we accept this paragraph on its face, then why are we battling to try to introduce a third party? Well, I don't know if he's battling. I think he's trying to find a solution. And so he thinks that if we make the papacy, we retain this idea that the papacy, which is correct, is this king that does according to his will, then we can come up with this new interpretation that we have these two other powers, king of the north, king of the south, coming against the papacy. But it's not, it's not removing confusion, right? Because he's claiming there's a problem. He doesn't define the problem well, right? Okay. You don't even, you know, he, he misses out all kinds of things. He misrepresents the problem. And then he goes through this long argument in several articles to try to talk about how Satan isn't going to fight against himself. And yet we have powers that he says are satanic powers that fight against themselves. So, uh, but part of that is because he wants to have uh, the king of the north in in chapter uh, or chapter 11, verse 40, to be some power that's not a satanic power. But at least that's what I think that he's trying to do. But he, he's he's not following the exact. If we studied the Bible in this way, we would just be guessing. Right. Understanding God's word is not a matter of guessing what you think something means. You go to the scriptures. You know, William Miller laid out the rules, the basic ways in which we do, do that. And he found those rules in the scriptures themselves so that we, we look at every place the Bible talks about it. We use the examples of the past as types of the present or the future, right? So if we have the king of the south and the king of the north in battles against each other, we're not going to have the king of the north and the king of the south mentioned unless they're in a battle with each other, right? That, and, and we clearly have shown that the Battle of Rathia typifies 1798 and the Battle of Paneum typifies 1989. That it's it's right there in Daniel chapter 11. In plain sight, was right under our noses. Um, we didn't notice it because we didn't spend the time to study in detail. We didn't deal with what he calls minutia. And, and yet the details are extremely important. So anyway, okay. go on. this confusion comes from viewing the former engagements of the king of the south and the north in their relationship to each other rather than to their relationship with the principal subject. In their, in their case, prior to verse 31, they are indeed fighting against each other, but it is always within the context of their relationship to paganism. Paganism is the dominant subject from verse 1 up to verse 31. In the case of the kings of the south and north after verse 31, they are not fighting against each other, but they are fighting against the king of verse 36, still within the context of their relationship to the principal subject, the papacy. The papacy is now the dominant subject. So, so what he's arguing is that up to prior to verse 31, we have paganism. It's represented by, you know, in, in chapter 11, it starts with Medo-Persia, right? Then we have Greece, Alexander's kingdoms divided, the four winds of heaven, the north and the south end up being the two principal divisions of Alexander's kingdom that end up uh, finally the king of the north conquers the king of the south so that his kingdom is once again united. But at that point, that's when Rome comes in and then conquers the Seleucid Empire. And then over time, it's going to conquer, uh, like a couple hundred years later, going to conquer Egypt, the king of the south as well. So once it conquers the king of the north, that sort of leaves Egypt uh, released from being a part of, of that whole empire, right? Is that kind of how we would look at it? Right. So, so it first conquers the northern part of that, but not the southern, and sort of conquers it, but it still has some independence, right? So it's, uh, but it wants to become, Rome wants to have it completely underneath the Roman Empire. And so that's going to happen in 31 and 30 BC, right? Um, so 
So he's he's trying to say that the king of the north and the king of the south derive their relationship to each other because of their relationship to paganism. So in the context of their relationship to paganism. But it's just in the context of their relationship to the land of Israel, right? Okay. Isn't that why they're called the north and the south? Because the north is north of Israel and the south is south? Well, it's because it is north of, as we would say, the pleasant land. Right. And it's south of the pleasant land. Yeah, so that's why they're the king of the north and the king of the south. It's, it yeah. has to do with in their relation to God's people. Nothing to do with paganism. The issue, the issue with this seems to be that he would have a disagreement that Rome establishes the vision. He does not seem to accept that Rome establishes the vision in any manner. Now, granted, this is this was something that Louis Weir presented and presented very clearly. Mm -hmm. He's trying to take this instead of Rome to say first paganism and then the papacy. Yeah. And, and, and you bring up Louis F. Weir because, you know, back in the 1980s, I'm studying Louis F. Weir. You know, he wrote this stuff in the 50s. What was going to happen with the Soviet Union? The papacy and the United States were going to combine to overthrow the Soviet Union. You know, he didn't have a time attached to it. Um, but that happened in 1989, right? Right. So, so I knew before 1989 that was going to happen. So he's now saying, well, that interpretation that you, that you understood, that you were then able to tell people that this was going to happen, and then it did happen, that interpretation was wrong, right? Right. And, and then pretty much all of the things that we have come to understand in this movement, the understanding of Millerite history, the, under, the understanding of the chronology of the Bible, all of these symbols and everything, those would have to be thrown out because they're based upon a foundation that, he, that he's now rejecting, Right. Correct. So, but he hasn't given us a good reason. I mean, he's 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 made conjectures. He's made some statements, lots of which aren't logical. But also, he's never proven them. He's never shown us using Miller's rules that he claims to use to show us this. So, to say the con confusion comes from viewing the former engagements of the king of the north and the king of the south as typical, really, because we would understand them as types. And he's just saying, well, no, they, they're not types. Right. Right. So, but that's the purpose of how the scripture is written, that things that happened in the past, all these things that were written, were written as in samples or types, right? So everything in the Bible is typical. It's, it's a symbol. It's a type of something. History is repeated. The, and so you can look at these symbols and see that you have the king of the north and the king of the south. You would have to look at the former engagements as telling you something about the kings of the north and the kings of the south in verse 40. And he's saying, no, you know, we, 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 we did that in the past, but now when we look at papalism, we have this other context. But but the king of the north and the king of the south are not fighting against paganism, are they? Right? Okay, if they're not. The the issue that that stands out quite clearly to me. Yeah. The name under which he operates his ministry, truth in types. He's not yeah. recognizing these as types. Right. So it, it's it's surprising. He's trying to push an entirely literal definition. He is following in the same path as did Uriah Smith. Yeah. Rather, but, but, but also here though, if if the king of the north, if he could show that the king of the north and the king of the south were fighting against papalism. Then he could say, well, these are typical of the king of the north and the king of the fight, south fighting against papalism, right? 
Right. But that's not what he shows. No, it isn't. Because that's not what happens, of course. Correct. Now, there's quite a bit more that I think we're going to need to consider on this portion. I do not really want to go back into his following thoughts because we do need to end this this session a little early. Yeah, yeah. So we'll come back to this tomorrow, dealing with the scattering and the gathering. Are there any other comments or thoughts on this at this time? Well, the only thing that I can say is, uh, you know, I don't like being frustrated when I read something that somebody has written. You know, and generally I don't read stuff like this that's written poorly, because usually if stuff's written poorly, it usually shows poor thinking. Um, but sometimes it's important to read things, even that are written poorly, right? Uh, to try to understand them. And, you know, he's a friend of yours. And, and it relates to things that we have finished studying. But uh, I really need to talk to him. Well, I'll see what I can do. All right? Yeah. yeah, okay. All right. So shall we close our session today with prayer? Mm -hmm. Gracious Father in heaven, help our unbelief. Help us, though, to understand what others are saying. Help us to be able to rightly apply those words and these lessons that you have been teaching us over these last several years. We pray, Father, for your guidance today. Direct our steps. Help us to understand all that you would have us to know. May your will be done. May your name and your character be glorified in all that we do. Help us to this end. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.